All right, let's talk a little bit about Ryrie. Any uh, particular questions, comments, observations on the uh, last couple chapters that that we read? <laughs> yeah, in one of the chapters, I forget on the, I forget which one that was. Yeah, Rapture, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, which is one of the reasons why why probably this section of his book is longer than most. You know, again. Um, any other? Uh, things on any of the chapters? You read four or five or six, something like that? It's interesting that when he's talking about the, uh, you know, the judgment seat, you know, just the various different judgments they never put together, you know, that there was more than one yeah. happening. You know, and then um, he's talking about the outcome of like, the judging of believers and their works. Um, you mentioned like a couple times, like believers, we feel a sense of shame for things didn't do or did do that were worthless and yeah. things like that was a new concept to me. Yeah, that's often an, an un, uh, it's an unaddressed concept that, that you know, I'm, I'm glad he, he did, he did bring that up and, and we'll, matter of fact, maybe we'll even jump over to the passage and I think it's 2 Corinthians um, that kind of makes it clear that there'll be some of that going on, but. Yeah, judgments, uh, at end times, different judgments, you know, different resurrections. Those are some of the difficult, difficult things. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts from Ryrie? I was just had a question. When you said on uh, six or six, I mean, the, the dead cannot communicate with the living. I don't think the guy in the office manual came back. And, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't yeah, um, I, I think, you know, yeah, it, it clearly, clearly was um, uh, an exception. And I think the way we can clearly state that they cannot is that it's, it, it, it's not going on. Um, and, and we would say the reason they cannot is because God does not allow it. N not that he couldn't allow it. He, he, I guess he could allow it, and he did with, with Samuel. I guess one other example that we would have that the dead communicating with the living um, would be the transfiguration of Christ when he was in the presence of Moses and Elijah. Um, so, but those clearly exceptional type of, uh, of things that go on that, that the dead are kept in prison per se. Demons are free to roam about, but, but the dead are not. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, your probably the, you know, information that makes you right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and still a lot of that that uh, that goes on in a lot of different um, a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Uh, we were on page <coughs> two ninety two. And uh, he starts off on that page dealing with the second coming of Christ. Uh, it's, it's interesting because in all, of the, in all of the disagreements that happen or the differences of opinion that go on, especially in the context of eschatology, the second coming of Christ is not one of them. All right. Uh, everybody who's a Christian believes and recognizes and has hope in the second coming. There's disagreement on what is going to be the timing of the second coming in relationship to these other events, but on the fact that that Christ is is coming again, there is no question, uh, which, in a sense, um, you know, is it's. I don't know what's the word. It's um, not comforting, but it is. Um, 
this may be a, it's appropriate, you know. I mean, that it is it is the big issue, you know. How he comes, what things are going to happen, those are have a degree of importance and relevance to us. But but the big issue is that he is coming. Uh, a number of uh, of of verses. Uh, let's uh, let's look at Acts one eleven. Which is, is really an important verse, I think, on lots of, lots of levels. Um, that, that whole Acts, um, that Acts, you know, you know section. Uh, matter of fact, let's start reading at verse 6 because we'll probably talk a little bit more about the millennium later if we have time. Somebody want to read uh, 6 uh, through 11, chapter 1? So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching the cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Yeah, and let's do uh, another, uh, at least uh, right in Acts 3, 3.21. See if we want to read anything before or after that. Um, yeah, let's do three nineteen through twenty one. Somebody want to read that? Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the word world began. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the the idea there that that uh, after this period of restoration um, is you know that there will be the, the return of, of Christ spoken of as the the prophets um, of old. Uh, if we go to Revelation nineteen, it actually talks about the event of the return, describes the event that is the the actual return of Christ. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Some, somebody want to read that, that event? Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. His rider is called Faithful and True. He judges and makes war in righteousness. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe stained with blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth, so that he might strike the nations with it. He will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. He has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How far are you saying? Uh, to 2021. 20, then I saw an angel standing on the sun, and he cried out in a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying high overhead, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of their riders, the flesh of everyone, both free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies, gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. But the beast was taken prisoner, and along with him the false prophet, who had performed the signs in his presence. He deceived those who had accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Okay. Um, so a number of passages. There's, there's, I have another one here. In, in the notes, he had 2 
Peter, well, we won't, you know, too long of a passage. Second Peter 3.16, I starred, but we won't, uh, we won't read it for now. So a number of places uh, talking about uh, the return of Christ. Uh, go back to Acts, if you would, just for a moment. In that first passage that we read, uh, and so when they had come together, they were asking him one six, saying, Lord, is at this time you're restoring the kingdom? Uh, and he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the epochs, which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Spirit has come upon you. And the, the interesting thing you should note about that is that uh, you know, Jesus did not say no, I'm not restoring the kingdom. I mean, his, his answer clearly implies, I am restoring the kingdom, but it's not for you to know when. Uh, and and that, that is important on a couple of, couple of levels. One, uh, he clearly implied, he, he had, he had the, the best opportunity to say, don't you get it, guys, there is no kingdom. It's only a spiritual kingdom. And the kingdom is really a reference to the millennium. So we'll talk about that. And he didn't do that. He, he let them continue to believe that there would be a restoration of the kingdom, now is just not the time, so that they would look forth both to a kingdom to come and his return to set it up. So both of those are, are kind of, uh, are, are, are very much um, in that. And, and then the angel says, you know, confirms he, he will return just as he um, as, as he went. And so there is, you know, the, the, new, the, the scripture is just full of, of the uh, attestations, Matthew 24 and 25, talking about, you know, the return of, of Christ. And so all over the place. The only thing that's a question is, is it going to be before the millennium, after the millennium, sure. pre-millennial, post-millennial, or is there no millennium and the return of Christ has nothing to do with the millennium? And that would be all millennial. So, so that is debated, which in your notes then kind of go into, into those particular things. I don't know how much we spoke about post-millennialism before. Uh, a couple of things to add uh, to, to your notes uh, is that uh, historically speaking, uh, the uh, um, Augustine who... When was Augustine? 300s, 400, 3 and 400s, I believe. Uh, and Augustine, who was one of the most prolific and, and influential early church writers um, of, all, of, of, of all history, Augustine, for some reason, thought that that return was going to happen, uh, that the millennium was going to end in 800 A.D., uh, he picked the beginning of the millennium uh, a, a, a couple of, you know, like to 200 B.C. for some reason. Don't, I can't remember what that was. But Augustine, uh, you know, thought that, that we were in the millennium uh, and that in 800 Jesus would return and, and that would be the end of it. Uh, when Jesus didn't return in 800... Augustine now obviously long since dead, but those who were followers kind of said, well, it must have, the start date must have been zero, the birth of Christ. And so they changed it to 1000 uh, AD would be the return of Christ. And that obviously um, also came and went. And, uh, and then, so for a long time, those who held to, to, to post-millennialism uh, really didn't put a didn't put a timeline on it. it. It wasn't really wasn't a very common view either. Uh, but didn't put a timeline on it because the the the, the benchmark date one thousand had passed. Uh, and it resurged. I don't know. Did we talk about the resurgence of of uh, post millennialism around the late eighteen hundreds? Um, when the Industrial Revolution and all of the advances in science and medicine and food production and everything that was going on um, around you know, mid-1800s to the late 1800s, we were just making massive advancements in all kinds of things that, that was generating a lot of both cultural excitement about the future uh, and theological excitement about the future. Hey, you know, you know, we really are making the world better, 
and and yes, so maybe we really should be thinking that as soon as we fix the world completely, Jesus will come back. And so that at that particular time, there was a real resurgence in post-millennialism. People were starting to think, well, maybe, maybe these guys had it right. Uh, the First World War uh, took a lot of wind out of the sails. And it was like, well, okay, maybe we're not, you know, maybe we're not advancing as far as we thought we were. Uh, it didn't, didn't destroy it, but it took the wind out of the sails. A second world war, just a few gener just a, a, you know, what, a few decades later, completely decimated the post-millennial view, and, and it, it lost all, 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 all following. Um, up until, you know, probably, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it started to become very popular again. Uh, and at least in our portion of the world, it's become very popular because a, a, lot, of, a, a lot of Christians have, have become convinced and, and um, emboldened, for lack of a better term, by the uh, influence, the Christian influence in politics. And that if we just, we've seen some advances in the political realm by Christians coming together, and so the thought is, we just do this a little better and a little better, and, and we can, we can, you know, return, um, return both this nation but all nations to the laws of God. There's actually a theological system out there. Some of you may have heard about theonomy, um, which is living under the laws of God, theos God, namas law, uh, and uh, and there are a number of of people out there, growing ones, who are more and more convinced that we are going to change this world. We just need to get more active about it. And as soon as everybody gets active, we'll, we'll make it work. Dan, Dan is a, is a post-millennial in, in, in those responses. So I don't know if you've had any dialogues with him, but... Probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, but that's... It's it, interesting because like people, you know, Dan and other people kind of, you know, talk around that. It's like, but if you look at scripture, it talks about like, you know, wars and famines. It's like, it's not going to be great yeah. before Christ returns. Yeah. I, 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 just reading all this stuff and just you know, all the things with COVID and people, you know, yeah. um, they're taking away our liberties and this and that. It's yeah. Like, well, yeah, we know that's going to happen. I don't know why we're getting really worked up about it. I mean, we yeah. would prefer that it not because we wouldn't yeah. be comfortable. Yeah. But it's going to be a difficult time. Yeah. Not yeah. A better time. Yeah. Even if you don't take the book of Revelation as a tribulation, seven-year tribulation, if you look at it just as the church age before the millennium, which some people do, and there's nothing, there's nothing glorious and advancing in, in Revelation. Yeah, it's kind of... But it is not. Of all the positions, pre-millennial return of Christ, all-millennial return of Christ, and a post-millennial return of Christ, post-millennialism is the one that is, really has no biblical support. There's, there's one parable of Jesus where he talks about, you know, the, the kingdom growing like a, like a, mustard, like a mustard seed until, until it's big enough that the birds of the air, you know, flock to it and, and nest in it, I think it says. And some people say that, you know, that's, that's shown us that the kingdom is going to grow and get bigger and bigger and eventually encompass everything. Um, but that one kind of parable is a stretch to understand it that way, and there's so many others that talk about you know, the, 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 the apostasy and so many other things that it doesn't have much strength. But there is a lot of theological um, or maybe emotional desire that people have and, and, uh, and, and hold to it in, in, emphatically. So, um, uh, the, the amillennial view, again, we've talked about that, I think, a, a little bit already. Uh, I don't know that I have anything new to add um, on that. When he talks about Israel is equal to the church, um, you know, that is, that is one of two, you'll hear one of two things that, that, you know, the, and it usually goes one of two ways. Either the Old Testament Israel was the church, they were the church, and, and we're the church, and so we've all been the church. Um, and so either the church was fully in God's mind, that's, that's really what God meant when he said Israel, he meant the church, either that or 
a replacement theology where the Israel was kicked out and the church was kind of put in. Um, so they, they either completely overlap one another or, or they, they butt up against one another, one's out, the other's in chronologically. Uh, but either way, either way that, that that is a permanent and an unchanging position, that, that there was a, a permanent replacement uh, where premillennialism will, will say there has been a change of focus from Israel to the church during this epoch, um, but that's not permanent, and so they would, they would recognize a, a transfer of attention. It's just not a permanent transfer of attention, so that's a, that's a key distinction. Is there like a reference to the graft of a branch? Free? Yeah, well, I mean, is there a reference in the Bible? Yeah, yeah, it's in Romans, what, 7? No, no, it's like Romans 9 or 10. Mm-hmm. Or like the church being added to and yeah, it, it, and those within the, the nation of Israel that uh, don't believe are the ones that wither and die and, and then the grafted branch continues to grow. Or, I, I don't remember all of it. Yeah, no, you've, you've got a lot of it there on, on, your, on your mind that the, that the idea is an exhortation to the Gentiles who have been grafted in. Uh, and that even some of the natural branches, it tells us, were broken off. Um, Israel kind of cut off. It's in that context. Um, but then there's this exhortation not to be arrogant, because if he could graft in the wild ones, how much more able can he graft the natural ones back in? Um, so, yeah. And, I, and it's, uh, anybody know, is that 8, 9, 10? Uh, something like that. But... Um, but it's somewhere, it's somewhere in, that, uh, in that context is, is the account. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, there it is. It's, uh, it's 11. 11, um, starting in... Uh, you know, 17? Yeah, 17, 14, 15, for if the rejection of, you know... Yeah, somewhere in that area, that, that whole context is dealing with the rejection of Israel and, uh, and, the, and, and meant to both make it clear that, that God has grafted Gentiles into the trunk, the trunk being, you know, um, uh, you know kind of the, the, you know, the, 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 the people of God in a sense. But, um, so that's a great thing, but, but don't become arrogant. Yeah. Uh huh. That there's kind of a well. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm trying to think if 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 the way it, it is 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 in the text that it would dis. I'm not sure it would stand against the abutment. They could probably say, "See, they were cut off. We were grafted in," because it doesn't say that he will regraft in the natural branches. He just it just says, "Don't be arrogant because I can." Um, very easily. Um, but when you continue on in that passage, if you continue on in Romans 11, you know, where he goes, the, the duration of, of Israel's rejection, verse 25, for I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of the mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel, which means not a full hardening, not all Israelites are hardened, some are, and there are Jews that are, are saved today. So it's a partial hardening of happened until, and there's a time limit, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in and thus all Israel will be saved just as it is written. So it, so it seems like there is a, I mean, there's, there's this time frame. It's going to happen until this happens, hardening until the fullness of the Gentiles, and then all the fullness of Israel will come in which seems to clearly be referring to the, you know, the, the tribulation period, the 144,000 Jews who are converted, um, and, and all that will take place with, when God returns his favor to the, nation, to the nation of Israel. Another reason why, and it's problematic in other areas, but, um, but another reason why, I, you know, I, I mean, I don't, uh, in contrast to Ryrie and others, I, I don't think there are any Gentile, Gentiles saved in the tribulation. Um, you know, that's 
the fullness of Gentiles has come in and God is returning his, to the nation of Israel uh, to, to save them and that's all the end times type of stuff. Although, you know, that, that, that argument isn't completely watertight either. Mm. So, uh, tch, tch, tch. Uh, to note change here. Um, again, just a little bit more on 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 premillennialism. Uh, again, kind of tied, uh, driven by a number of different things, driven by the covenants of the Old Testament uh, when God promised to uh, to raise up from David. Um, uh, an offspring and that the throne of David would never pass away uh, and taking that to mean literal and, and, and both literal in that it was a real promise and literal that it was a real throne on, on this earth uh, and therefore that needs to happen. Uh, taking the, the covenant with Moses, I'm sorry, Abraham and the land and that Israel would be given the land for all of eternity uh, and the extent of the land that they would be given, as it was talked about, um, they, they never occupied the extent of it, and they certainly don't occupy it, didn't occupy it, you know, without interruption, it's been interrupted um, uh, many a time. So believing that those covenants still have, um, have a literal fulfillment, uh, and that uh, the, you know, again, the, the God returning to all the minor prophets, God returning to, to right the apostasy of Israel, which is kind of a main theme in the Minor Prophets. You've gone astray, God's sending judgment, and then at the end of most of the Minor Prophets, but God will once again send his, the Messiah, or you know, some reference to the Messiah, uh, in which all of Israel will be reunited to him. And that, that hasn't happened yet, so, so all of those promises seem to drive the issue of a, um, of, a, of a millennium. He's doing the eye thing again. <laughs> we, we, we were talking. We, we, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was funny. Um, but, um, but then all that kind of then, in, in, in a sense, the bow that goes around all of that, at least for, you know, for me it's a bow, is the, the outworking of the book of Revelation, um, and let's, let's go there, Rev, uh, Revelation, uh, to, towards the end. Um, we read about, we read in chapter 19, Josh read for us the return of Christ. Um, and I think you went down through 21, didn't you, Josh? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just reading through Revelation, you know, after you get done with Revelation 19, 21, the return of Christ, then we pick up in chapter 20. Uh, let's just kind of go around, around the room and, um, and uh, let me see, let's start, Lori, let's start in the back with you. Start reading Revelation chapter 20 at verse one. Uh, read however far you want, a couple of verses or, or whatever, and when you stop, then we'll just, we'll just go over Val to you and then to Rachel and then to Josh and, and, until, we, until we stop, okay? Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Yeah. 
When the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be led out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations, called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for a battle, a mighty army, as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up upon the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people in the beloved city. The fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, let's stop right there for now. Um, so we, we see the return, of, you know, as you look at this, as you just kind of read through Revelation, there's the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, and as soon as the return of Jesus Christ is done, uh, it talks about this thousand year, you know, Satan is bound, uh, locked in for a thousand years. I don't know if you notice how many times, you know, the term thousand years comes up here, six or seven, something like that. Was it six? Okay. Uh, six or seven times it comes up, uh, and and the you know that's where we get the term millennium, a thousand years, uh, and uh, and there is a, a little bit of of equating of things uh, that Christ has returned, and there is this period of a thousand years that Satan is bound, uh, and uh, and. Uh, and the you know the the believers um, the believers are are raised um, and uh, from in the first resurrection they the last part of verse four they reigned with Christ for a thousand years all of all of these things you know um, we read about the disciples you know reigning on twelve thrones and all that type of stuff and so and so what we do is we say well it seems more than just mildly obvious that this thousand years must be the same thing as the kingdom that is talked about so so often that Christ is going to come back and establish his kingdom. He is reigning now for a thousand years on this earth and so for a long time everybody recognizes that this is an allusion to the kingdom at least. That's why everybody, whether, no matter what they believe, believe the millennium is, is equivalent to the kingdom. Uh, and to the, the chronology here just seems just too kind of straightforward uh, to, to let go, to let go of. Um, some people would say, well, the book of Revelations is symbolic. And, and, and the answer to that question is the book of Revelation is not symbolic. The, the book of Revelation has symbolism in it. But it's not symbolic. It has, it has a, it's apocalyptic, so it has a greater amount of symbolism than other things. But much of it is, is, is very literal. It, this is where we read about Satan being cast into the lake of fire for eternity. I mean, that's not symbolic. That's, that's literal. Um, the resurrection of the dead. The dead are raised to life. That's not symbolic. That's, that's, that's literal. So... So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's got a lot of literalness in it, um, but because there is a greater amount of symbolism, some people would say that the thousand years is symbolic, okay? And, um, and it could be. I mean, you know, we can't, you know, we may find out that it is. It doesn't read that way, and, and a normal reading of it doesn't lead you to that, to that conclusion. Um, something else has got to drive you there, and the question is, is there enough other evidence throughout the rest of Scripture to, to drive you to, to think that this must, must be symbolic? Um, it would be like the same, well, I, I, think, I think hell is, is symbolic because it's in the book of Revelation. The lake of fire is symbolic. You say, well, could be, but as I read the rest of Scripture and other passages, it doesn't really seem to talk about a symbolic event. It talks about a literal one, so... Um, so uh, you know, it, all in all, there's a lot of a lot of very strong reasons to believe that Revelation is laid out in this sense chronologically, you know, um, and that's we should expect it to play out to play out um, as it as it reads here. Uh, we didn't, you know, and as we finish the chronology of playing out, after that comes the the, the general resurrection of the dead. Uh, the, the, the second resurrection that, you know, not the first that we read earlier, where the dead are judged according to the books. 
uh, and, and anyone's name who wasn't written in the Lamb's Book of Life is thrown into the lake of fire. And then chapter 21 is the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. The old one will pass away. Uh, and so once that final epoch, that final millennium, uh, that final literal reign of Christ on the earth as the, the earth is finally righted, then God starts afresh. And, you know, but it's kind of like the idea you know, that is often put forth that I think is, is, is helpful and right is God doesn't, God doesn't create, God does not recreate till he fixed the old thing. He didn't just junk, he didn't say, okay, the earth was a failure, I can't win on this game. You know, Satan kind of outmaneuvered me. I can't win and, and, and have a, a kingdom of God on earth. You know, I tried that. Satan perverted it. Therefore, um, I'm going to have to create, destroy this earth and create another one. Um, you know, God brings it to a completion, and, and, and it's a display of his omnipotence and his patience that God can have a kingdom of God on earth anytime he wants to start one. And so he, you know, he brings it, he brings, he makes it clear that he was not outmaneuvered um, before he, he creates um, the new heavens and the new earth. So um, uh, an interesting thing on that, uh, the, just some data. Anybody know what Jewish year it is? Doesn't matter what Chinese year it is. Jews don't, Jews don't count track, don't count time the way we do. They, they, they count, I, I think, they, they believe they count from creation. Um, if, if you, but I, I think this is the year of 5777. Is this year, I think. Let me think. No, 8. 5778. Um, since, since Adam, since creation. Um, um, and um, don't know if that's, you know, you know, um, yeah, if that's uh, what it is or not, but um, but if you if you use their reckoning of of Adam um, uh, instead of Unger's, Unger had four thousand four B.C., um, which would make us if Unger was right, if it was four thousand four B.C., we would then be uh, let me see, nineteen ninety six would have been three thousand six thousand years. And we're 23 would be, well, no, maybe it is the same. Maybe it, is, it, is, maybe it goes off the same date. But we, today would be somewhere around the year 6,000, um, uh, 6,022 years, um, um, according to Unger, 6,024, 24 years from, from creation. So I guess all I have to say, whether you, whether you reckon it the way the Jews do or you reckon it the way Unger did, both of those are, are putting out somewhere around 6,000 years since the creation of Adam. Unger we have a, has a little bit older earth, is used a little bit younger earth. Um, it was interesting, I mean, when you got back to the turn of the millennium, it was easy to envision if Unger was right that there would be six, you know, six millennium and a seventh millennium being the millennium. That there would that would exist that that day came and went. If Unger is right, that day came and went. Um, it would have been again 1996 would have been the seventh millennium. Um, if the Jews are right, um, then I guess we've got 220 more years before the next millennium. Whatever it's worth, but but. Um, so you might be, somebody might be able to check on your computer, what, is the Jew, what, what year is it according to the Jewish calendar? But I think it's 5778, if I'm not, if I'm not, um, yeah, because the Jews hold that God created in 3761 B.C., where Unger thought it was a little bit further beyond that. So, not that that matters, but I thought you might find that interesting. Um, I have mentioned a couple of times, I think I have, that, uh, well, I know I've mentioned a couple of times that eschatology is hard, and it's kind of like one of those, you ever do those puzzles that, you know, it's got pieces, and, and you think you got it, and this, this all fits, and you end up with one block piece that doesn't fit in there, 
and say, well, that's all right. If I just take this one out, I can put that one in. Well, no, then this one doesn't fit. And I take that one out. And I mean, you've done those kind of puzzles, right, before that you think you got it and you have to take it apart and put it back together again and there's still one thing sticking out the side. No, no, no. Well, eschatology is, is, is a lot like that. At least in my mind, it's a lot like that. And, um, and I've, you know, I've come to some conclusions about um, eschatology that are, are, are fairly in, uh, in, in tune with what uh, you've read in your books with uh, some minor differences. Um, but my conclusions have no explanation for who's going to be around in the millennium and how is there going to be a rebellion in the millennium. Um, and, uh, and so the next section he talks about is the population of the millennia kingdom. I, I must admit I am not convinced by the arguments that are here on who's going to populate the millennium and how all that's going to happen. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, to be honest with you, I find, this, I find this very hard, but I don't find this convincing that you will have Gentiles who are saved during the tribulation who will then enter the millennium, who will uh, all be believers, that's why they did, because all the unbelievers are judged at the end of the tribulation. So there are no unbelievers alive at the end of that, of, you know, Armageddon and the judgment, only believers, uh, no, unbe no unbelievers still in the flesh, okay, unresurrected, unraptured. Um, um, all of the, you know, you know, the Christians were raptured, those who were alive before, so they've already got their eternal bodies, not their temporal ones. But nobody with a temporal body on earth except those Christians who were saved during the tribulation, that's why they weren't raptured, and they survived the tribulation. And so they have a temporal body, they will enter the tribulation, they will enter the millennium, everything will be good, because Christ will rule, they will procreate much as we do today, they will live much longer, because the lifespans we know in the, in, the in the millennium are going to be different, the animal kingdom is going to be different, uh, the lion will lie down with the lamb, the guy who lives to only be 100 years old will be considered a mere youth, the scripture tells us, so a lot of things will change there, maybe look more like the pre-flood world than the post-flood world. Um, but with all that longevity, with marriage, with natural procreation, the earth will be repopulated. But just like this earth, those, those children born will, be, will need to determine for themselves whether they will be redeemed or not redeemed, whether they will follow them. They'll be forced to follow King Jesus while he's on the earth. Forced is, you know, um, or, or compelled by, some, by just the, the majesty and the might of King Jesus. That there will be no thought of coup or, or attempted coup. Um, but when Satan is released, they will form this, this very fertile seed ground for those maybe like the angelic realm, uh, who as soon as Satan decided he was going to go, the whole bunch of angels seemed to jump on board and go with him. Maybe something like that. But the, when Satan comes and says, we need to throw out King Jesus, there will be a, a large receptive audience to that and, uh, and that will bring about the, the, final, the final rebellion that we read about in Revelation and destruction. Um, so a lot of it seems to, seems to brief well with, with what we know about the, um, um, the millennium, what must happen there. Um, but uh, again, I'm not quite sure how you get this initial group of people um, in, the, uh, in the millennium. But, uh, but that would be the, the way that, um, that uh, your author, the, both authors, Ryrie and the Mock, um, would articulate it. It's very common articulation, uh, excuse me, of it. Um, but one that I, that I personally find unconvincing and and I and and I and I and I, I just I think that the, the the message of no Gentile conversion in the tribulation is pretty strong in my mind. So the idea that there is Gentile conversion is pretty weak, and and this this view kind of is contingent upon that. So thoughts, questions, comments. Um, how important is it? Who populates the millennium? Will those, like, according to 
too, like with the juicing population, like the millennials, is, uh, is that something you that group? I, that's who I think will populate the millennials, the 144,000 who were sealed and marked. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it is possible that the 144,000 is symbolic, you know, that there would be many, many more. 12,000 12, from 12 tribes, and it's stated that way, 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from this tribe. You know, that's pretty emphatic kind of uh, you know, numerology. Um, so it might be more likely to be, but maybe not, maybe it's just a literal, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other thoughts? Uh, it's, I think it's okay to be, to be dumbfounded about future things. You shouldn't be dumbfounded about the return of Christ. I mean, again, but other things I think it's okay. Uh, some other things you should not be dumbfounded about or kind of confused on or I'm not sure I see that is the issue of a bodily resurrection uh, he talks about here. And again, when you put all of Revelation together or all of eschatology together, you end up with a couple of resurrections. Matter of fact, if we were going to, based on your reading and what you know, uh, how many different, and when we're talking about resurrections, we're not talking about resuscitations like Lazarus, who, who, who was brought back to life only to die again, but we're talking about resurrection unto a resurrected body that is then eternal, never to die again. Um, how many different events of resurrection do you think you could articulate in the scripture? Articulate, somebody articulate any of them. Would you count like um, Enoch or Elisha? Are you talking about specific people or groups of people? Um, well, it could be, we can talk about specifics. Because they um, went, you know, and then war with God, you would think yeah, like eternal bodies. It, it, I don't think Enoch and Elijah have eternal bodies. Okay. Um, and Because it, it, it looks like a rapture, like their bodies will change. Um, but I, I, I just, yeah, they might, but I don't think they do, and, and there's a reason I don't think they do, and, it, and it's, it's reference, it's part of resurrection, so, so, so what, what's the first resurrection? Jesus. Jesus, okay, and, and he's called, so that's one, that happened, it's all by itself. That's, he's the firstborn, and if he's Elijah the, can't be yeah, one and two, three. yeah, yeah, if he's the first fruit of resurrection, there must be another explanation for for these others, and, and that's why I, I kind of hold that. So one, one would be Jesus. We, we, there clearly was a, a resurrection from the dead for eternity with Jesus. What other ones do the, does the Bible uh, articulate? Well, like 1 Corinthians, when is it 1 Corinthians where Christ returns and the, the dead, those who died first? That's, that's, uh, that's Thessalonians. The, de the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are al alive will be caught up in the air. That's not the return of Christ, technically speaking. We, ca we, we call that what? Rapture. The rapture. So at, at the rapture, the rapture is only half of the story. There is, you know, maybe, maybe the word partial rapture is really true. Part of us are raptured. The other part are resurrected. Okay? There is a resurrection at the, the dead in Christ rise at, at the rapture. Now, again, where you put the rapture depends on whether this is an overlapping event with something else or a distinct event from something else, but, but that, is, that, is, that is another one that's clearly talked about it. Where's another one? Well, one we just read about. Well, which one? We read about two. Those who had been beheaded and not accepted the mark of the beast. The, the first... The first resurrection, right? Isn't that what it calls it? That there. Yeah, in, in verse five, this the, is the first resurrection. The first resurrection, which happens after the Armageddon. Armageddon before the millennium. But it is clearly just the millennium. Millennium. I don't know. Millennium. But it is clearly just the resurrection of believers. Okay, so that one is there. And, what, and we read a second one, Josh, which was what? 
I think we read it actually. I mean, it's there if we didn't. What? I don't think we. Well, maybe we didn't read it, but what? So the, the resurrection of the unbelievers. The, the second resurrection of the unbelievers after after the millennium, after the final rebellion of Satan, and then all the dead will raise, and the books will be opened, and and they will be judged. Okay, so. So we have at least four resurrection um, events. Um, our, our authors here, uh, and I think for, for good reason, uh, you know, would say that you know, this is kind of the chronological order and this is pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, um, post-millennium, okay? Would, would, be, would be the idea there. Uh, and it seems to be pretty laid out that way uh, in the scripture. Obviously, a little bit of a, of a, of a question, are these two overlapping events? Um, or, or, are they, or are they the same event? Um, you know, this is called the first resurrection. This is called, the, you know, the second. So, so um, you know, we got a, there's two S's in resurrection. There's only one, isn't there? Right? One? Yes. One? One S. Two R's? Yep. Yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, but those are, those are some of the different, um, the different resurrections uh, that, uh, um, you know, that exist. Uh, and again, who goes up? Uh, like our authors would say, this is only New Testament saints, that the Old Testament saints are resurrected here. Um, I tend to think that all saints are resurrected here at the rapture, old and new, but it's only based on kind of an assumption on what seems like, you know, if, if and Ryrie did a good job of this, Ryrie talking about the eternal state, you know, did a good job of arguing that, that, that all believers are in the presence of the Lord now. Remember, did you remember that section? He said, some people would say that, New Testament believers are in the presence of the Lord. Old Testament believers are held in another kind of place awaiting the general resurrection. And, and he said, ah, it just doesn't make sense to me that I think that all believers, everybody old and new when they died went into the presence of the Lord. And, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I agree with him. I think he did a good, I think he, I think he was right on that point. And, 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 I, and I kind of carry that over into this. He wouldn't carry it over into that, but. But I would, but again, I, I don't know that there's any exegetical data, you know, one way, um, one way or the other, at least not an overlay in my, in my mind. So, but those are the different resurrections, at least that, that we know we talk about and in, in that, um, in, in that are happening. And uh, along with the resurrections, then we also have, and, and I think it was Ray that started talking about this, Uh, we talked about the different judgments, and that's another area where there's, um, is like, okay, well, there's, the Bible talks about more than one, you know, and, and, okay, or maybe it was Josh who was saying that, you know, I kind of never really thought about, you know, more than one, and which one, where, when are they happening, and, and when are they, yeah, yeah, when are they, when are they going on, and he talks about judgments um, on the, um, uh, under point G. Oh, before, before we go, uh, before we leave resurrection, it, it, is, it is important to note that though we may have some questions about, about who, what, when, where with the resurrections, we have absolutely no question about why. Okay? Who, what, when, where may be an issue. But why we must be absolutely f affirmed in, there must be a resurrection of the body because that is what humans are. Humans are material and immaterial. Uh, and we were created that way. And the, the e intermediate state of our souls being separated from our body is a false intermediate state that only exists because of sin and is not an eternal state of man because man is created as man. 
and the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of the dead, not just eternal consciousness, not just eternal life. Lots of pagan religions would hold to eternal life. But the bodily resurrection you know, of, of the dead is a, is a very much uniquely Christian and a fundamentally Christian aspect. Uh, it is not secondary that, that our body, we, we will go into eternity with a physical body, um, just like we were created. That's how we were made. It's going to be a little different, we know, um, but, but physical. Matter of fact, and we can say to some extent, I had this discussion with my sister when she was here recently, um, uh, that not only will the body be physical, but in some way, don't ask me how, in some way, it will be this body. You know, it's this one for me. You got yours, and you got yours, and you got yours, and that's what's going into the resurrection. It's not just, well, well I'm going to give you a body, but I'm, I'm going to make you a new one. I'm going to put you in a new body. I mean, it is a transformed body, but it is not a new body. It, it is the one. And I can state that emphatically. Okay? Any, anybody know where, what, what proof text I would use to state that emphatically? Transfiguration. Um, transfiguration helps. Mm -hmm. Certainly does. Um, you know, Moses and Elijah were somehow recognizable, but even more so. More so. What's that? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm waiting. I have a little drum roll. Jesus, when he walked out of the tomb, it was the literal DNA body that he walked in there with. It wasn't a different one. There was nothing different about it. There was nothing left behind. His had not undergone decay. And that's why I say ours, ours may have, and so how God's going to put all that back together again, I don't know. Well, they didn't recognize him. Uh -huh. But he, he yeah, but that, that, yeah, but the body, there was nothing in the tomb. There was no corpse left behind. And he said, you know, touch, touch my hands. Look at, these are, these are the hands, that, the same ones that were up there. Um, so it, very clearly, Christ possessed that which they laid into the tomb was the exact same thing that came out of the tomb because there was nothing left in the tomb, right? And it wasn't like God zapped it away and made him a new one. It was transformed, but somehow God transformed that. So, so it's not just a body. We will be raised with these bodies. Um, and if you think, well, I wish I would have a different body, you know, I wish I would have a body that was, that was bigger or littler or taller or shorter or whatever else. Um, I don't know if God's going to have all of us have, I, I, I actually don't think that the issue in heaven is going to be that we're going to wish we had it, that, that we're going to think that some bodies are better than other bodies. I think that we're going to look at the kaleidoscope of bodies and be able to look at them and say, wow, aren't all those bodies cool? You know, I think we're going to appreciate the diversity more than we're all going to be made into uniformity, if you know what I mean by that. You know, we don't necessarily appreciate diversity uh, in, in, this, in this context, but I think our, that's my own personal opinion. You know. I don't have any... Should. Huh? We probably should. We should appreciate diversity a little bit more than we do um, in, in the good sense of the term, not the, not the politi politicized sense of the term. Okay, so judgments. Um, he had on page 303, judgments of believers, judgments of the unsaved, uh, judgment of Satan, uh, and he, uh, how come he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't even list, and um, yeah, he doesn't even list them. Uh, the judgment, uh, so uh, it, it, Ryrie, Ryrie has four, I think four. Uh, the judgment of believers, but sometimes we call the Bema seat. And, and I think maybe we make too much out of the different pictures there. The, the Bema seat, which happens for all the believers right after the rapture. We're raptured, we go to the Bema seat, we'll look at that passage in just a minute, and we're judged. 
the the um, the, uh, the, 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 the Old Testament believers will be judged after their resurrection. That will come after the, um, um, after the, um, uh, the tribulation. The resurrection that happens after the tribulation will, would be theirs. And then all of the unsaved uh, will be judged, both Old and New Testament, all unsaved will be judged at after the millennium, at the great white throne of judgment, um, and, uh, and Satan also. I think he, uh, where is Ryrie's chapter on? 602. Six, six, oh yeah, he actually had more on that chart too, didn't he? Well, yeah, I guess, um, so. Yeah, and, and it was, yeah. And, uh, and if you look at the, the timing, uh, the believers um, at the rapture, and then the Old Testament saints, the tribulation saints, the living Jews, and the living Gentiles, all of that at the, at the end of the tribulation, the next one, and then at the end of the millennium, you would have all the unsaved Satan. In, so I guess, I guess he, he would have, in a sense, three, three different judgment epochs, although different judgments uh, that would um, that would uh, exist. Uh, uh, the let's go to the you know we read about the great white throne of judgment in Revelation. The books were opened, uh, and so that's kind of real clear to see that that after the millennium, before the new heavens and the new earth, bef- there will be the general resurrection of the dead, and with that resurrection, there'll be judgment. Second Corinthians five ten is what is often referred to as the Bema Seat Judgment of Believers that is then usually put at the point of of the um, of the rapture. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we were made manifest to God. I hope that we were all made manifest. I guess just stop right there at, at 10. Um, and um, a couple things in that that's, I think, worthy to note, and Ryrie alludes to this. Josh talked about it also. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of, of, of Christ and each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So everyone, meaning all, believers and unbelievers, um, everyone giving account for good and bad. Sometimes it's put forth that, that believers will not be, the, the believers have no judgment, just a question of rewards. Who's going to get more and who's going to get less? Uh, and, and I think that's an overstatement of the case. Uh, believers will not be condemned. There is no condemnation for believers, but there will still be a judgment. Um, Ryrie talked about, you know, the graduation ceremony analogy, and maybe there's some some good pictures there that, you know, um, but uh, but it will be brought to light all that we have done, uh, whether good or bad, uh, and and I guess like somebody mentioned last week, it was you know. You know, does that happen right here, you know, or does it happen at the great white throne later when everybody is judged? Uh, and, and, and again, it seems more likely to happen here. Um, it would seem kind of strange that believers would be in their glorified bodies and still awaiting some type of judgment at the great white throne. Um, but, uh, but um, you know, again, we, I think... I think a little bit we got to be careful um, with some of those things. Uh, it, it, a lot of the issues with resurrections and judgments and all that type of stuff uh, does, does make you sometimes, at least it makes me, sometimes, um, 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 what's the word? Um, want, desire, uh, um, what's that? Long for, long for uh, um, jealous of, be jealous of the all millennial 
simplified eschatology that Jesus will return, there will be a resurrection of the dead and we'll all be judged. <laughs> right? And that's, that's it. It's kind of like, he's going to come back. All this stuff you guys are talking about, millenniums and tribulations are just are not the factor. There's coming a point, Jesus is going to come back. When he does, he's going to raise the dead, judge them, and then we're going to enter into eternity. And it's like, well, that is kind of, that is kind of pleasantly simple. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, but maybe, maybe simplistically um, simple. But, um, so some thoughts on, on, uh, on judgments. Questions on, on, on any of that? The last couple things that you should be thinking about, which we don't often think about in the context of eschatology, but they are eschatological themes, is one is what is the intermediate state? And uh, where, where do you go while you await the end times? That is an aspect of eschatology. Uh, and both Ryrie and, and the, the author wrote about that. Uh, the biggest questions to ask is wherever you are, are you conscience, conscious or are you not? Uh, is, your, is your consciousness held in a sleep mode until the time comes? Nothing in the scripture other than the first Thessalonians passage that says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. There's that, there's that, that, that reference that you know, maybe is just a metaphor, but maybe it's more than a metaphor. Um, we tend to take it as a metaphor because too many other passages say to be absent from the body is to be with the Lord. Elijah and, uh, and, uh, and Moses were not sleeping when they met Christ in the Mount of Transfiguration. Samuel was not sleeping when he met, um, actually it does say, why did, why did you disturb me? But, um, but he certainly wasn't sleeping when he met uh, Saul. Uh, so you have, you have uh, you know, again, mo all the references clearly alluding to a consciousness, Lazarus and the rich man, you know, both in conscious either glory or torment. Uh, so, so the idea of a soul sleep is, 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 is not held by, by most people. There's a consciousness. Our, our physical body is decaying in the grave, but our consciousness, our persons, our our, our, um, our, our thoughts, our, I mean, everything about us, if you, could, if you could separate us simply from the body, but, but, not, from our, but not from our being, our, our being is still there in our soul existing somewhere at some, at some place, finite and, and localized. Um, and and if, if, we are, if we are in the Lord, it's in one place. If we're not in the Lord, it's in another place. Um, if we are in the Lord, it's in the presence of the Lord. If we're, out, if we're not in the Lord, then it's in, a, it's in some area of, of darkness, dungeon-like. Not, not hell yet, but a, but a, but a holding for hell. Um, and, you know, kind of like, um, kind of like you know, the, the holding tanks at the uh, penitentiaries before you go to court. You know, you're held in the pretrial confinement, and it's, it's not hard labor yet, but... Um, but you, you know, you you'll be signed hard labor at the court, and then you'll go to someplace else. So that's you know kind of the, the picture there. But that's a part of of end times end times uh, thinking. Um, questions on, on any of on any of that as you think through it, or or, or comments. Uh, and then the final destiny, the issue of the eternal state. Uh, heaven and hell, uh, and heaven, which is how we all usually term, relate to it, heaven and hell is not really, I don't know why we do it because it's so hard to break old habits, it's not really heaven and hell as the eternal state, the eternal state is what? The new heavens and the new earth and hell, the lake of fire is, is the eternal state for the lost, but the eternal state for the believer is a new heaven or new earth, new meaning Absolutely, the old one smashed to smithereens and, and dissolved away without any trace of any sorts and an, and an entirely new one created or the old one, kind of like our bodies, transformed, you know, using the same gunk but matter but, but perfecting it, re, remaking it. 
is a, is a point of content, not contention, but discussion amongst people. Um, I tend to think towards the um, reformed more than, than completely restroyed, but destroyed, but, but that's just a, just, there's a couple of references to that, but nothing that's, you know, fundamental. But that is the, that is the, um, uh, the eternal state. The length of the eternal state is, is spoken about as eternal, both for, uh, for the believer and the unbeliever. An uh, important, important thing to remember about the eternal state of unbelievers, we think more about the eternal state of believers, uh, the eternal state of unbelievers in the flesh. Uh, and remember, believers in the flesh, eating and drinking in the new heavens, eating from the tree, the trees, and around the, we're told we'll have 12 different fruits, eating 12 different seasons, we'll eat, we'll drink, We'll do lots of things like that. So there's going to be taste. There's going to be all those kinds of things. There'll be feelings, sensations, all that type of stuff in our, in our, in our new bodies. The same will be true of the, of the uh, unregenerate. We'll have a physical body uh, that, uh, at least metaphorically, but probably literally, uh, will be in the flames, but never consumed. If you, if you think about the torment of that, it's, it's amazing. You know, when we burn people at the stake, they don't burn very long. They, they burn until they die. Um, when you burn in hell, you, 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 you burn and never stop burning, ever. Never goes away. I mean, and and, and it's, it's probably the pain of, of being in a fire, burning. I mean, it's just, I mean, the, 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 the imagery there is, 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 is amazing. Um, so um, something to, to think about. Um, some people try to try to placate that with nihilism, that eventually God will burn them up till, till they destroy. Um, yeah, he, there's no inclination in the scripture that's, that's, the way, that's what he does. Um, um, if he does, that'll, it'll be the right thing, but there's no inclination in scripture. Matter of fact, scripture speaks just the opposite. Some things to think about. Um, both authors, I believe, closed with some analogies of uh, the, old, the old and the new, some of the, the book end types of things, uh, creation, recreation, fall, restoration, triumph of Satan, judgment of Satan, curse imposed, curse removed, driven from the garden, enjoying the garden, you know, tree of life um, uh, in both gardens. So just a lot of clearly, clearly the, the, the picture of the of the end state is meant to be a bookend to the beginning state. Uh, we are we are to to understand that that God, what God, what God set out to do in this chapter, um, He finishes, He accomplishes in this chapter, and and everything else in between is deals with the fall is getting from this one fallen back to this one restored. And so, so clearly Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is a bookend to Revelation 19, 20, and 21, um, and, 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 and rightfully so. so um, one of the reasons why we talk about the telos of God, eschatology, you know, God's going somewhere, he's taking somewhere. This, this whole thing of history is not circular, it's linear. There was a beginning, and it's going somewhere. This world to an end, but then a continuation in the new world. So, uh, so that's it. Um, we, any uh, parting comments on anything that we've discussed or, or, or anything in general? And now would be the time to do it. We're done with class. I appreciate everybody uh, giving so much diligence to the, to the workload uh, and to the, the discussion in class. It makes it a lot easier for me. Uh, to uh, to have to have uh, you know that type of engagement, so I appreciate that. So, uh, well, let's close in a word of prayer. Ray, you want to close us? Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for the uh, the class that we just uh, just finished up. Father, we thank you for the new things that were taught to us. And Father, we thank you for some things that were just uh, helped to be understood a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Father, we do thank you for uh, Pastor and the time that you put in for this class. 